the most advanced underground tunnel factory system the Germans have created during the Second World War was that of the Bergkristall. It was under overall command of SS General Hans Kammler. It was only 10 kilometers from Linz, Adolf Hitler's birthplace, and in the middle of one enormous industrial complex owned and run by the SS or the HGB. Here, by the use of tens of thousands of laborers, nearly 1,000 jet fighters were constructed during the war, a third of the Luftwaffe's planes, 10% of its guns and much more. However, it is an area covered in controversy, rumors of special research and testing, subject to much speculation, cover-ups, and seemingly covered in a veil of governmental informational darkness. Over the next episodes from here, I'm going to try to clarify what actually happened here. And I will try my best to separate the stories, the rumors, and the gossip from the official report and present it all to you in a clear case as to what needs to happen in order to uncover the truth here and what the obstacles are and possibly why. Let me first give you a little background. Hermann Göring had entered his political office in 1933, coming in swinging for German industry. And slowly he created a vast network of businesses, supporters and industries. He was also fast to absorb the arms industry of Czechoslovakia in under his umbrella in 1938, and with the takeover of these and the rest of Czechoslovakia. And certainly also here in Austria, he would let his influence be felt. Knowing how important iron ore would be to the Reich, and especially in case of a future war, he had waged a small battle against the German iron industry, until he finally established his own metalworks. And after the Austrian Anschluss, a larger steel works was located here in Linz, the Hermann Göring Werke, HGW. It soon developed into one of the largest European industrial combines as it gobbled up small and big industries alike. And it was not a state entity. This was solely under the control and ownership of Göring. It would swallow up any company of interest and in turn own 78% of Steyr Daimler Poch and 100% of Steyr Gus Stahlwerke, whom in turn owned one of the Swiss arms factories. The list is way too long to mention, but Göring had played his cards well and created an entity rivaling that of the Reich's own economic office, completely ignoring its complaints, including those of Hjalmar Schacht. Similarly, Himmler had begun to create and obtain industries for the SS in order for them to generate revenue. Now, these two vast powerful entities had met and established deep-rooted collaborations here in Linz and Gusen and elsewhere. Both were run by intelligence, ambitious men, and it cannot have escaped Hitler's attention how the 2.5 million Allied prisoners in Germany during World War I had somewhat contributed to German industry and agriculture then. What its main camps and many subcamps then would be something that would modulate his new model for the camp system in the coming war. In April 1938, the SS founded the company Deutsches Erd- und Steinwerke GmbH, DEST, D-E-S-T. It was established in Berlin. Over time, this company would become responsible for most of the SS operations. It would also operate brick manufacturing plants at Sachsenhausen, Buchenwald, and the stone quarries at Flossenburg and Natzweiler, as well as Großrosen. DST would, by the use of concentration camp inmates, profit to finance the SS. In early 1938, Himmler and Oswald Pohl visited the stone quarries of Mauthausen and Gusen. Here, Pohl had established a concentration camp on the site of a large stone quarry to initially hold a thousand people. The initial inmates were all Class Three hardened criminals at this time, but this, as we know, would change. But his, as Paul's plan was, to develop this into a large commercial enterprise for the SS, and it eventually became one of the most profitable 
for the organization. In 1939, DEST Berlin decided to establish a new administrative complex at St. Georgen Gusen, a town just a few kilometers from the concentration camp of Mauthausen Gusen complex, and until the end of the war, this administration center was a key installation between the Fischenhaus Verwaltungshauptamt, WHVA, of the SS in Berlin and the camps of Mauthausen and Gusen. Initially, they specialized in providing granite stones for the Reich, but when strategic situation changed in 1942, it became a subcontractor of the leading German arms production companies and thus in business with Göring. Initially, they constructed barracks and factory halls for the army and to produce aircraft engines and parts of machine guns. Here, eventually, two distinct tunnel systems were built, at least that we know of, Bergkristall and Kellerbau, which came first. Both were preceded by a vast concentration camp of Gusen and Mauthausen. Mauthausen has a currently large museum which can be visited every day, but Gusen, which was two-thirds larger than Mauthausen, with over 3,000 SS guards at its height, it had been largely ignored and forgotten, but for the dedicated work of a few people. One of them is Rudolf Haunschmidt, who will talk us through these important events. The others, sadly, can no longer be with us, as they were the former inmates themselves, who had to initially finance the Gusen Memorial after the war, initially for many years with no help from the Austrian government. Today, a large part of the Mauthausen camp have been preserved and is open as a museum for people to visit and see the conditions of the prisoners. It holds its own story in the Third Reich, one we'll explore with Dr. Christian Dur in a later episode, in which I will share some of the interesting stories of the time of its liberation and some of the horrors of the inmates and exactly how this fit into the SS economic policy. Now, one of the more interesting SS projects here was Kellerbau Tunnel System. It was begun already in 1943, but design studies date back to 1941-42, at a time where huge Messerschmitt manufacturing halls were already set up in Gusen. By 1943, the SS operated a huge industrial facility with Steuer Daimler Puch, manufacturing rifles and small arms in this tunnel system. In fact, 10% of the weapons for the war was made here in Gusen. However, what makes Kellerbau special is that it was a dedicated SS-only construction under their control completely, whereas the Bergkristall tunnels could be seen as having been commissioned to the SS by the Air Force for jet plane constructions. And this we will dive into more over the next episodes. As Gusen Mauthausen was providing and producing the majority of the large stones, granite for the Reich, there was a plan from the SS early on to construct a large industrial harbor here. General Kamla, not a general at the time, had been part of this planning process and had sent experts here for evaluation. But Albert Speer personally stopped this project, as it was by now, 1943, completely unproductive given the war situation and the emerging threat of Allied mass bombing of German industries. Speer determined it is far better use of resources to begin constructing underground production facilities safe from bombing, and it is most likely that Speer brought this importance of the underground locations home to Kamla. And he began to create these many underground factories from this point. But Gusen was an important turning point for Kamla and his career. He had already built several things in Linz, the place of Hitler's birth, and Hitler had himself ordered the construction of underground shelters for the people of Linz. These were constructed by Kamla, as some of the first. Now remember Kamla both worked for the SS and for the Luftwaffe and this put him in a perfect position to coordinate the work between these huge dominant entities. Linz is only 10 kilometers from Gusen. Hitler studied here as a child and he loved the area, 
Later in life, he had envisaged his own mausoleum was to be located here in Linz. This was an important place in many ways, and also one of the last to surrender. In fact, there were SS troops who kept fighting several days after the official surrender here, and there may have been several reasons for this. By 1943, Goosen was already producing 20 ME 109s every day, at a time where the bombing of German cities and industries had just begun. Now the SS shifted focus to beginning to build or obtain underground sites for their commercial partners. The SS would rent companies the production space they needed, they would rent them their labor, and SS units would provide the security. Here, first, they began to dig the Kelabau tunnel system, codenamed Escher 1. It consisted of 12,000 square meters of workspace. Here, they were sheltering the production of machine guns by Steyr Daimler Puch AG. Kelabau was located directly north of the Gusen concentration camp and the above ground airplane manufacturing halls. It was constructed mainly in stone as it had not yet been deemed necessary to provide large amounts of concrete currently being expended on bunkers elsewhere. Kelabau was assigned primarily to the two DST contractors at Gusen, Messerschmitt GmbH and Steyr Daimler Poch AG. Messerschmitt started production of the ME262 there during 1944. But when the Bergkristall tunnels became available in autumn 1944, Messerschmitt moved to St. Georgen Gusen, the larger tunnels, and left most of Kellerbau tunnels for Steyr Daimler Poch, who continued to produce parts for machine guns there, as had already begun. Now, one tunnel was also assigned to the Waffentechnische Lehranstalt from Graz, Defense Technology College of the SS. This was done in the final phases of the war. What they were researching seems relevant and interesting. Also, some of the institutes of the Technische Hochschule Graz, the Technical University, was moved to Gusen in late 44 and were hiding in the tunnels of Kellerbau. Certainly we need a clarification as to what they were doing there. Shortly after, the much larger Bergkristall underground tunnel system was built nearby at St. Georg in Gusen to shelter the production of ME-262s. This tunnel system was codenamed Escher 1, with more than 50,000 square meters of production space, almost 9 kilometers of tunnel length. It was one of the largest German underground installations that reached full production status in late 1944, and according to Allied intelligence reports, it was, and I quote, one of the most modern and most complete underground plants in Germany, end quote. It was constructed within 13 months by prisoners of the Kassett Gusen II concentration camp within the Mauthausen Gusen complex. It became one of the most horrible concentration camp sites in European history, due to its high mortality of up to 98%. The average survival period was four months. And that is important because, in fact, we know very little as to what actually happened and was done inside the system. And that corresponds with how few surviving witnesses there were left after the war to talk about it. We thus need to look to Allied post-war reports as to what was found and happened here. And that is where the problems with the history of Bergkristall begins. Now these tunnels, as with all underground World War II locations in Austria, governed by a private company, S-Consult, that was hired by the Bundesmobilgesellschaft and the Federal Monuments Office, thus the Austrian government. S. Consult appears to take their guidance from, amongst others, the Mauthausen Memorial. They hold the key to who are allowed to visit, research, or see these sites, and clearly stipulated under Austrian law. And I quote, 
research only with the approval of the BDA and by recognized experts, Section 11 of the Monuments Protection Act stipulates that investigations through changes to the Earth's surface for the purpose of discovering or examining monuments under the ground area may only be carried out with the approval of the Federal Monuments Office. Such permits may only be granted to persons who have completed a relevant university degree. And for clarification, this usually does not mean military historians with an interest in anything other than established facts or history. Now, around 2012, historian Andreas Sulze began to share some of his research and actively began digging for missing tunnel systems in the area, based on wartime testimony. He was promptly shut down, despite having obtained permission from the local mayor's office. Now, he was researching two separate locations to begin with, based on aerial photographs from the war and wartime testimony, and in both he found something that might be significant. So, in 2013, a group of Austrian experts, all affiliated with Mauthausen, S-Consult, BIG, the established universities, and the governmental offices, did set up a commission working with Herr Sulze and began investigating these sites, taking soil samples, taking core samples, photographing, and put together a long extensive report countering Andreas' claims. Now, I have met with several of the people who were involved in making this report, and over the next episodes I will try to break down the claims from both parties, although I have never actually met Andreas Sulzer or spoken with him. I will try to identify the problems as I see them. And judging as an outsider, historian and military man, who have spent quite a number of years underground in strange tunnel systems, fort, castles, bunkers, and on battlefields, I have some background knowledge. I have even written quite a few reports of my own. Now, granted, none of my degrees are from an Austrian university, but I can clearly see the problems, and fortunately, I also may have the solutions to these. Sometimes, being an outsider not familiar with the local intrigue or the players, it makes it easier to take an honest, neutral view at a problem and come up with a solution. Because this is an important part of history, of military history, and people died here, and everyone deserves to know. And as always, I will try to show you what is here on the ground and under, or photos from the time at the end of the war, as always. Now, this here opens up to new problems. Now, you see, they would not allow me into the Kellabau tunnel system, despite it being in fairly good shape. I was allowed into a very small sanitized section of the Bergkristall under controlled conditions, because, I, I don't know if I forgot to tell you, it is rather radioactive, and it needs to be vented first. Anyway, they would not let me see the remaining main part, and this brings us to yet another problem here. From 1989 and onwards, the Austrian mining authorities and BIG have undertaken a large operation to literally and physically fill up the tunnel systems with cement. Up to 85% of the almost 9 kilometers of Bergkristall tunnel system was filled. They bored holes from above through the hill and poured in cement, wheeled in barriers to support this. It was done for the reason of stabilizing these tunnels, as they were feared to collapse, and now houses were being constructed above some 30 meters up. And had it not been for the diligent work of Rudi and some of the other survivors, these tunnels would probably have been filled up, closed, and the entire system would have allowed to disappear from the landscape. And there are several other reasons for this that I will go into later. Regardless of the safety issues that may and may not have been involved in the decision to destroy such an important part of military history and to destroy a place where thousands of people died or was worked to death. And, as if none of that was bad enough, the final insult to historians is knowing from American reports how important this place was, how technically advanced it was, 
and that research was located in them. And yet, they have so far refused to release any photos from any of these tunnels. The American reports are still missing to be found. Now, throughout the report made by Mauthausen on their investigation, they continuously state that they undertook photography, and also, throughout the filling of these tunnels, every part was photographed, surveyed, documented, in order to determine how best to accomplish this. I have requested these photos, as they were cited to have existed or been taken in the report. The wartime reports are all missing. These were supposedly conventional airplane and weapons factories, so I don't see the need for secrecy. After the first season, you all asked me, well, where's the evidence? Where is it? Where is what we're looking for? I'm standing on it. Andrea Schulze is an Austrian historian who did research. And it's actually quite simple because the information was, first of all, in the Allied aerial photographs. Here was an octagon. It's about one meter underground, give and take. Andreas got permission to dig it up, and he did. And he found it, and it's there. It's right underneath my feet. And fortunately, Rudolf Hanschmidt spent quite a bit of time talking to us and trying to explain it all. Here in this direction, approximately 30 to 50 meters from here, there was found a few years ago a huge octagonal con uh, uh, concrete structure. and. Uh, a structure we know from aerial reconnaissance photograph was actively hidden uh, uh, from the Allies, from the Americans that came here in, in, in May 45, by the Nazis, as one of the last deeds they did here. They had some reason to hit this structure. Yeah? And it was uh, unknown for many decades, and it was excavated a few years ago by a German TV team, and uh, they didn't dig long uh, for the structure. Uh, promptly, the Austrian authorities stopped any further exploration. And so the secret of the structures is still a secret. And we hope that within the next years, it will be possible to learn what this huge concrete octagonal structure really served. Generally, the Mauthausen report contends that this is a ventilation shaft that's located on the outskirts of the known tunnel system. They did survey a small corner of it, investigated it, took measurements, and drilled boreholes where through they put cameras as far as I can understand. I will try to decipher over the next episodes the Mauthausen report and their findings. The Mauthausen part, this is worldwide known but two-thirds of the former, former huge complex were kept off of the public. They were hidden. So it took decades after the war, especially in Austria, that the Austrian politicians got aware that there was a central complex bigger than the Mauthausen complex at Gusen, consisting of two concentration camps, Gusen 1 and Gusen 2. Gusen 1 was the older one, it was a real twin of Mauthausen, it was the same size as the Mauthausen camp, already uh, designed in 1938 to 1940. Actually this, uh, this camp started in 1940 along with the stone quarries here at Gusen. Uh, in early 1944, when the SS decided to develop a huge industrial park at Gusen. Uh, they enlarged this, the Gusen system with the Gusen II concentration camp here and, and also with a railway connection that was already from the period 1941 to 43. They connected this concentration camp with uh, the Bergkristall underground Messerschmitt plant at St. Georgen, what you can see here. So that means the inmates of Bergkristall, they were accommodated here. It was the most brutal concentration camp that ever existed in Austria. 
therefore it's also not well documented because there are only a few survivors that could write about Gusen in the decades after the war because most of them died yeah? and, 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 and these inmates they had to dig this huge underground plant at St. Georgen and also to manage the, the production processes that were already implemented in this underground system starting in autumn 1944. That means, this is what Bergkristall makes it special, that it was uh, not only a construction site, it was in an operated plant in, yes, uh, the final months of World War II. And also important what you can see here is the Kellerbau tunnel system at Gusen. This is also very important because everybody knows about uh, the underground dispersal in Nazi Germany. Yeah? But Gusen is a very special place because this underground plant, the first uh, design studies date back to the autumn of 1942 with the German Luftwaffe. And, and this underground system was already started in construction already in 1943. That means at the period ahead of the rest of Nazi Germany. In other words, the SS used Gusen uh, to uh, make an exper a first experimental underground uh, bump-proof industrial facility directly adjacent to the concentration camps in order to offer the German war industry bump-proof underground production space. And the shooting range is right over here behind me. That's where Andreas also, because of witness testimony, post-war, found an underground tunnel entrance. The moment he found it, they all said, well, you can dig, no problem, there's nothing here. Then he found something, they shut him down like that. Andreas is a, a, a tough guy because whatever he is doing is based on actual documents he's finding. Yeah? And one day he found a document, an interrogation document of a German prison of war that was in the vicinity. This is what the, how the intelligence, uh, military intelligence works. Whenever mm -hmm. they yeah. find a prison of war, they ask him, where have you been and so on. And, and then they're using the suitable information. And there's one intelligence report of a guy that was in this vicinity and said, Yes, and there's the rifle training station in St. Georgen, the place we are now here. And uh, from not far from this installation, there starts an underground system, a third underground system. And this is coming from an intelligence report of the Allies. And this is why Andreas Sulzer started to dig here. Not because of having a dream no. or of, 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 of having heard something. But it's interesting. Just reading it in a document. And when he presented the document to me, he said, I can't imagine that it was here. I said to him, let's look in this hill over there. Therefore, I'm standing here with you, because this was my guess. But Andrea said, no, Rudy, you are wrong. If the intelligence report says it was here, it must be here. And it couldn't be over there. And so he, he went around, talked with the proprietors and started digging. 150 meters away from here and after one hour he, he found the first traces of, of an escalator going down and, and so on. But it, he couldn't finish his job of, of, of digging it out or to finding any uh, access into a, a, a possible tunnel system here because uh, the Austrian authorities stopped him uh, too early. Yeah? And they literally did it in a matter of hours and had the place turned yes. into a preservation area in a, in a weekend. Yes, it, indeed. We took pains to get uh, important artifacts of goose and buildings under monumental protection. It took us 20 years with the authorities in Vienna. But when the authorities wanted to stop the, uh, the diggings here, it took them a weekend uh, to give this structure under monumental protection and with this argument to uh, to stop any further exploration here. Yeah. We have been at Bergkristall 
And Pecristal today is well known as one of the most advanced uh, and modern underground plants in the German aircraft industry in producing jet planes on assembly lines in mass production. Yeah. And we also know from our research that there was not only the Luftwaffe Corporation working there. Yeah. We know that also a group under the auspices of Hermann Göring also had a project in the vicinity of Bergkristall. This is very likely that second installation that is not disclosed up to now. This is maybe the second installation that all of the world is searching for here at St. Georgen. Yeah? And uh, since this is relink linked to the name of Hermann Göring, yeah, it is likely that maybe under this HGW code, yeah, uh, actually you find some organization like the Reichspost yeah, or other official state uh, institutions that were definitely involved in such special projects. Yeah. We don't know whether there was a, a cyclotron operated in St. Georgen or not, yeah. uh, but it may be, or it's clear, that such an installation would never have been operated by the Messerschmitt Aircraft Company. It must have been operated by this group that was actually at St. Georgen under the auspices of, of Hermann Göring. Yeah. But uh, there's too, uh, much res too less research is done up to now. But I tell it to you, because if you have the possibility to find documents that go into this direction, it would be very helpful in order to learn what also was going on here at St. Georgen, at Gusen, Gusen II, uh, in the last months of World War II. But since so much speculation leads us down the nuclear path, let me give you some background. Otto Hahn discovered nuclear fission in 1938. Even before the war, all research institutes were reunified under Niklas Rehl, who along with Otto Hahn, both understood the importance of nuclear discovery, both economic and militarily. And in the spring of 1939, they met with the Army Research Office to discuss the feasibility of the practical use of nuclear fission. The Army requested that the Auerberger provided several tons of uranium compounds from their stocks and they in turn immediately began to build a production plant to produce uranium oxide for the Army testing. By 1940, the first 240 grams of high pure uranium metal was delivered. Now one of the most prominent scientists working for the German post office and ran their nuclear program was Manfred von Aden and do not think of the German Postal Service as underfunded. They had vast funding and direct support from Hitler, who met with Aden several times. And after the war, Aden became a key figure in the Russian nuclear program, and was even decorated by Stalin himself. Given Himmler's animosity towards Heisenberg, I would be more inclined to believe that Schumann, head of the Army Weapons Research Center, working with scientist Kurt Diebner, who had operated several reactors, would have been more successful and better provided for. Both men were in Ordorf proving grounds at the time where an extremely large bomb test was made in March 1945. It was witnessed by quite a lot of people, and one was told of the bomb test previously by an officer who worked for the Postal Service Nuclear Research Office, working with the SS there. This was a location where also both Kamla and Fiebinger was busy constructing huge tunnels by the proving grounds. And Kurdibna had a reactor not 10 kilometers away in Stadilm. Now by 1945, when the Auerwerke facility fell to the Russians, 330 tons of uranium and radioactive materials and 7 tons of metallic uranium was found here alone. These were the materials that the Russians used to start their first nuclear reactor after the war. But Niklas Rehl and von Aden, along with other German scientists, went to Russia to accomplish this. And it's safe to say 
that the Russian nuclear program leading to their bomb development was founded by German materials, designs, and uranium as well. Speculation have now begun to surface that also the U.S. nuclear bomb project benefited to a greater extent than previously believed from German research, blueprints, and materials, of which we now know there were a lot more of than we have previously been led to believe. The German nuclear research program had grown during the war. In 1943, the Army High Command had agreed to release 5,000 scientists for active service for the nuclear research projects. In 1944, Himmler ordered a further 14,600 scientists released towards this effort. This was seconded by Göring and Bormann. Speer, however, did not agree, but it was overruled. And given what we now know the Russians found after the war, we may wonder what the Americans actually did find or had been given. The top leadership in the Reich, SS, Himmler, Kamler, Bormann, had all backed these efforts, so they cannot have been insignificant. Also after the war, the later head of the Russian nuclear program, George Fleov, spent a lot of time, similar to the American Alsace teams, trying to obtain information about the German nuclear research scientists. A lot of testimony exists witnessing the underground German research labs placed in the tunnels and former mines. In 1983, Fleov had recounted how a German prisoner, a scientist, had worked for the Postal Service but was tasked with installing several cyclotrons in underground labs run by the SS. Of course, the Alsos teams were here in Austria and Gusen as well. And given how relatively little logistics it takes to run a nuclear reactor, then, as we saw with the fourth known German reactor that Kurt Diebner ran in Stadilm, it was run by a diesel-powered generator and was basically a hole in a tunnel. It would by no means be impossible for one to have been run here, although I will point out that so far no contemporary documentation for this have been presented. Although we also know quite a few cyclotrons and betatrons were running throughout the German Reich, and at least one was said to have been operating here in Austria. This would also not have been an impossible task here. Although it would be noted that prominent, very prominent, French and other nuclear scientists from around Europe were housed here in Mauthausen as well as prisoners. But for now, let's follow the known documentation. Gusen is a very important place also to study the SS as an organization. Uh, many people think yeah, the SS was an official German army or something else. Yeah? And people forget that the SS was a private army, the private army of the Nazis. Yeah? And that, uh, especially at Gusen, we can learn from the documents that the SS also uh, always make, made big business. At first, they uh, made a lot of money for, for the Nazi party by buying lots of land for the later Gusen concentration camp from the local farmers for cheap prices. And one or two years later, they sold the same lots of land to the Reich for an extra money. So they were in the real estate business, more or less, already in 1938 at Gusen, and made a lot of money. And later on, at first, as you know, they were in the uh, business of construction materials, granite production, especially Gusen was a special place because it was the biggest granite industry of the SS operated all over Europe. It was really, in 1942, the biggest and most modern granite industry in Nazi Germany. This was also Gusen. And SS invested hundreds of thousands of Reichsmark here at Gusen in order to play a key role in the supply of, of, of granite, especially for monumental buildings in the new dwellings that the Nazis wanted to erect in Eastern Europe, Ukraine, parts of Russia. As we all know, uh, there was Stalingrad and the Soviets managed to get the Germans out again of the country and also the SS had to react at Gusen and they reacted and they shifted production uh, in early 1943 
they went away of the granite and they went deeply into uh, uh, the war industries and we had at St. Georgien the local administration of the Wirtschaftsverwaltungshauptamt in Berlin and so it was easy for them to sign contracts with companies here in southern Germany and in Austria. The first business contract they signed here was with the Steyr Daimler Puch AG, a very important manufacturer of uh, small arms and, and automatic rifles for the Wehrmacht and later for the Waffen SS. And the second big, big deal was done with the Heres Zeuganstalt, the Ordnance Depot of Vienna, along with the uh, uh, recycling of, of gun carriages and so on, also for the war. They were directly linked with uh, the Ordnance Depots in Ulm, Germany, southern Germany. And finally, they had a, an important contract with the Messerschmitt GmbH of Regensburg. Regensburg was a very important manufacturer of, of, of fighter planes in Nazi Germany. And already in 1943, when the first bomb raids uh, hit the installations at Regensburg, it was clear for them to have that they have to disperse the production. And the most important dispersal site of Messerschmitt Regensburg was here at St. Georgen at Gusen. Yeah? And they called it, it is the Zweigwerk St. Georgen, means the, the St. Georgen branch plant of Messerschmitt Regensburg. And at first, uh, it was an above-ground installation. They had two huge production lines for the production of fuselages and wings for the Messerschmitt 109 conventional uh, propeller fighter plane and produced it already in large numbers. And the business model functioned very well. And then they decided to go underground to use Bergkristall uh, as the key site as the heart of the assembly of the fuselages of the Messerschmitt 262 jet planes. And it was planned that they should manufacture each month more than 1,000 shots units, but actually they didn't manage it. We know it from documents from the Smithsonian in Washington, for example, that they already managed in March 45 to get an output of 450 units per month. But imagine, today we can say that at least 80% of all the jet plane fuselages ever produced were actually produced at Gusen 2, St. Georgen, in this huge top secret underground plant. And let's go back to business now. Yeah? Uh, the Bergkristall plant was designed to be operated with 10,000 slave workers, 10,000. Yeah? until 1955, 10 years. Yeah? So at 45 we were at the beginning of the production. Yeah? And imagine 10,000 workers and each of these workers, of the slave workers, Messerschmitt had to pay to the SS six Reichsmark per, per man. Yeah? 10,000 times six, 60,000 per day. Yeah? And, and multiply this with 365 days and 10 years. Yeah? It is a, a, a million of, 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 of Reichsmark business. Yeah? And this is what Gusen stands for. It reminds us that in the final phase of, of World War II, the SS was indispensable for the Nazi war industry. Germany, uh, the Messerschmitt couldn't produce any jet fighters without the the assistance of Kamlas SS, yeah, and they provided uh, the, uh, the bomb-proof underground plants like St. Georgen, yeah, and Messerschmitt provided the know-how, and the Luftwaffe provided the materials, yeah, and these three uh, players together were behind the scenes here at St. Georgen, actually. Was that seepage that you filled in? Was that from water coming through? No, this uh, was done because there are a lot of um, wooden parts yeah. and they might fall out. And uh, this is not good if you have visitors, it's a problem. That's interesting because usually you wouldn't see the wood unless they needed to work on it. 
Unless you need to mount something. No, it's uh, um, the, this is the you have, you have inside you have uh, the wood to to get the surface. And, and this and there's also one on the other side. Oh. And to fix it you have the wooden parts between. Because usually I was taught that, that the wood or the, or the hanger, the clamps to hang on stuff you were working on. Yeah, these, these are the clamps yeah, the, where you can fix. And then there's the, the wood shape is right, is right behind. No, the wood shape. Uh, the, the, yeah. wood, the scaffolding. The, 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 the wood on the other side. Uh, that's that's the, 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 the fixing of these two surfaces. Yes. Oh yeah, I saw, I saw the... You don't um, have it here, but you have it up there, because it's, uh, um, they, they dig out, not this form, they dig out a little bit more. Yeah. And to, to reduce it, to, to make this profile, uh, they have a wood also on the, out, on the other side. And this is the, common, this is the, the, the wooden part between, is to to fix both yeah. surfaces so that you can fill in the concrete. This is all original. Sorry, the the only thing what is not original is the white color. The color is uh, was done later. But it, it was didn't they? It wasn't it white as well during. No, no. That, that was just the gray. It was gray, uh, especially this gray up there. Yeah. Uh, that's from the blasting. Oh yeah, I can see that's a little uneven. It's burnt. Oh, it burns. It burns a whole. You know, I've I've seen a lot of the tunnels that were blown. They're all black and sooted. Yeah. And I was wondering about that because explosives usually don't burn. Yeah, but it's, it uh, depends what kind of explosive. And this was phosphor, as I am. Holy hell! I don't know. They really wanted to do it right. Yes. Because I saw the same thing in... in the, 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 Rus the Russians, they used the phosphor pump. And therefore, uh, was it the, the guys out, they lived there, they told us uh, it burns for days. Yeah. That, now, that explains a lot. Because the same thing in Jonas Tuttle I saw. Yeah. So this is original too? No. This was done by the... By us. Oh, that's not by you? Yes. Okay, because, because I was... Because there was a big problem and uh, uh, we fix it with this. So I will. And uh, then we fill it with concrete. Okay. So it's safe to go through. See, I always wondered about when I see those photos, it's like, I've never seen Kamala build this way anywhere. Uh, <laughs> this was feeping as well, right? The surface, uh, yeah. Through. This was built by Fiebinger as well. Yes. And Kellerbau was Fiebinger as well. I saw him. Fiebinger. I thought he died 10 years ago, 20 yeah. years ago. 2014. Really? Oh, oh yeah, that's not that long ago. Yes, yes. So how, what was he like? He was a, a, an absolutely expert. He must have been. Yes. Talking about nothing. He never was here. <laughs> He don't know anything. <laughs> I've heard that story nothing, before. Nothing. So did he want to talk about what he did for the Americans in America? Yeah, I asked him, but he said no. Don't, don't want to talk about that either? No, nothing. Not a word. So yes, okay. So like, so is there a utility tunnel underneath? Yes. Of course. Oh. So when there was production here, what was? Do you know what was where? They were doing the airplanes here. Yeah. And then, what else? What else? They've been doing those different companies that was in here. Yeah. It, this was like quads, different companies. Yes. Uh, 
Schauberger was supposed to have had a little lab up at the camp or down here. Yes. Did you ever meet? You, you met his son too, or his grandson. He's actually very, I, I like, he's a very nice guy. Schauberger's grandson. I think he's an idealist. And I think Schauberger was an idealist as well. Which makes you wonder what, uh, how did he end up here? But I don't, I don't think there was anything, I don't think he was a bad guy. And I think he had the same problem in America, where he was just at the wrong time, where everybody started talking about rockets, and he wants to talk about natural propulsion, yeah. and everyone is trying to get to the moon before the Russians, he was just the, the wrong time. Uh, I mean, I understand why he was here. What else was he going to do? If, if you're unemployed and mentor, what are you going to do? Yeah. Was, the, was there always a ramp before? Or did you make that too? No, the ramp. Originally, there were some stairs to come to the second basement. Okay. Yes. So this was. I don't know if we know everything that took place here. I don't think we will ever totally know of what research was done during the war. Austria, Germany, strange places. But there's a lot more to it. You have to remember, so much wartime production during the war moved underground. It wasn't just Kamla's 20 tunnels. It was everything. There was hundreds, hundreds of underground factories during the Second World War. And this was one of them. Kellerbau was the first. And here, in the Bergkristall tunnels, that I have always wanted to see. It breaks my heart a little bit that I can only see maybe 3% of them. There's another section in here behind me that is too contaminated and not cleaned up and unsafe. And then there's all the others, this rows after rows of tunnels, they filled up with cement for stability. And I hope somewhere there exists pictures from before they did that. This, this somehow is a place where people work to death and some of the most modern designs of weaponry was produced. And then there's the research that we at this point can only speculate until the Russian and American archives will tell us what they know. But I'm glad I flew 10,000 miles to see this.
bit of wooden door sill here. It's something that would have been a very heavy door, I'm imagining. And then the same thing here. This is an identical doorway on both sides. These are identical. I wonder what that was. thicker than the other dividing wall. See the shrapnel from the explosion. So I guess they blew this hole. I wonder why the Russians or anybody would blow this up. Always so many questions when you start looking into what was done in research during the war, you would think all these questions would have been answered, clarified, cleared up. Third biggest tank production plant over the hill. You have explosives here. You have massive it's industry yes, and yes. metal industry here. You're in this, and you have not far from here, an hour's drive. You have V2 testing sites, manufacturing. You have the Ebensi is not far. Quartz is not far. Huge underground production facilities. You have you are in the center of a production hub, and you are fairly safe from Allied bombing. So if ever you were going to put secret atomic research, it would be here. Of course, of course. Maybe, let's say, in mid-1944, maybe we could have thought, let's do it in Thuringia. Because before uh, uh, D-Day, so the strategic situation was not that clear. So, Nazi Germany, the borders were the Atlantic Ocean, yeah, until the mid of 1944. And, and the Russians were also far behind, yeah. But uh, the situation changed rapidly during summer 1944, yeah? and at, at, at last in, let's say, in autumn 44, it must have been clear to each strategist of, of Nazi Germany and also at the enemy side yeah, that uh, all the important uh, things had to be concentrated not at the outskirts of the Reich at the border to Poland or, or Eastern Germany, it was clear that they had to go uh, to the vicinity of the Alpines, of the Alps, yeah? to Upper Austria, to Lower Austria. And this, we find this clear in the strategy in the, uh, already at the end of 1943, with the decision to dig in strategic uh, underground plants in the vicinity around, let's say, Linz, Austria, and 100 kilometers circumference. Yeah, and uh, also history proved that 
these areas here, east of Lanes, had been the, the last areas that were liberated by the Allies. So that means Nazi Germany existed at longest here. So that means uh, we have reports that we know that the official end of World War II was on the 8th of May. The official liberation was taken to place here at the 5th of May. Yeah? So three days before the end of the war, the Americans came in, but we also have records that in the hills around here, even on May 9th, after the end of the war, of the war uh, fighting action occurred between SS groups hidden in, 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 in the area and, and, and the Americans. For the Americans, the war was not over here on May 8th, only on the paper. But actually, it took any, a few days longer. Yeah? And also this indicates uh, how important this location was at the real, at the, at the final end of the war. It was really among the places that had been under Nazi control at the utmost end. Yeah. And it took time, even at the very last days of the war, to still cover things up, like the octagon. They still buried things and hid things and covered them up. Yes. We, we know this from reports, also from survivors' reports, and also from written documentation, that it was clear strategic goal. Uh, the SS started to prepare uh, the erasing of the traces here at Goose and St. Georgien at, the, at least at the beginning of April 1945. That means one month before the end. Yeah? Because they couldn't know when the end really would be. And they started at first with the liquidation of hundreds of unfit workers. By, by killing them with clubs in Gusen, by gassing them and so on. Yeah? To get rid of the unfit. Because the, the order was given uh, from Berlin that at the end of the war, a few days before the Allies are actually uh, coming in, uh, they should uh, make an air raid alarm. And then with this air raid alarm, 20,000 inmates of Gusen should be driven into the tunnels and then they should be uh, should be killed by being uh, uh, detonated in the tunnels uh, with, with high explosives. And it is well uh, documented that Bergkristall alone was equipped with 24 tons of dynamite already prepared just to be exploded, detonated. Yeah? And it was the first things the Americans that came in over here on this road on May 5th. Yeah? The first they did was to go to Bergkristall and to cut the wires to prevent that any SS men would by chance press the button. Because if they would have pressed the button, uh, maybe 20,000 would have been killed, yeah? or at least uh, a lot of the high technology that was hidden below ground here at St. Georgen would have been destroyed forever. Yeah? And the Americans didn't even manage to get it all out before they had to turn over to the Russians. Yes, it's, what also makes this, uh, this area very important is that <clears throat> it was not only a place that belonged very long to the Nazi Empire, <laughs> yeah? uh, the Americans that came into this area first only had three months of control here in this area because after three months in summer 45 they had to had give it over the area to the Soviet Union yeah, with all the strategic plants that were erected by the SS here over the years yeah. and as we know from documents and reports is that the Americans only could bring the most important strategic installations and toolings uh, uh, to a safe place on the other side of the Danube to Linz in order to prevent the Soviets to get the know-how of the SS here at Gusen and at St. Georgien. Yeah? And, but we also know that it took the Soviets one and a half years to dismantle all the industries here and hundreds of, of trains loaded with high-tech equipment and with high-tech materials 
were sent from St. Georgen Gusen to the east. And it wasn't even a peaceful handover between the Russians and the Americans. Yes, there are reports that say the Cold War started in St. Georgen in May 1945. Yeah, because uh, the things the Americans took away from here already should belong to the Soviets. Yeah? So they took Soviet property, more or less. Yeah? Uh, <laughs> I don't think they had any negotiations with Stalin, whether they allowed to do it or not. Yeah? But they did it. And so we also have reports from American liberators uh, from that final days in July 45, when they crossed the bridges the final time in Linz, the Dan over the Danube River, that the Soviets, they shot after them with ammunition. Yeah? So they di didn't say goodbye friends and we have conquered the Nazis. So when they separated in uh, summer 45, they were already enemies. They were already in the Cold War, or maybe it was a hot war in this, in the, in this period, here in this vicinity of, 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 of St. Georgen and Gusen. We have evidence that uh, co uh, construction engineers that were responsible to design the Bergkristall underground installations were sent from St. Georgen to Ortruf uh, in order to help them to get the underground facility uh, uh, into operation there. So this is what we know, there's a direct link between St. Georgen and Ortruf. Yeah? We also know that there was a link between St. Georgen underground installations and uh, the underground installations at Leitmeritz, Bohemia, Litomershice today. I don't know the, yeah, the, the project name, name now. Yeah? But we also know that, for example, SS guards were exchanged from the station at St. Georgen with Leitmeritze, yeah, for example. Uh, also interesting is that you know maybe there is Waldbersberg Kala, the huge underground, also Messerschmitt plant, but it never went really into operation. This is what makes it dif different to St. Georgen. Yeah? But we know that Bergkristall delivered in a certain period at the end of 44 a set of fuselages to Kala as, as, as specimens how the proper design of a jet plane fuselage has to look like. Yeah? So these specimens were sent from this top secret plant at St. Georgen to Kala. So this underlines also how central and how important this plant was for the Luftwaffe and for Messerschmitt in, in this final phase of the war. Yeah? And also interesting is that we also have documented that guys that were involved in the German nuclear program uh, it is written about it is written they say it is Hauptmann Oldeborshus or the Oldeborshus yeah? it's a it sounds like a name of the Netherlands but check this name yeah we know definitely that this uh, this Hauptmann What's the problem in English? I don't know. Captain. This captain, yeah, thank you. This, this, this captain, yeah, this guy, he, who was deeply involved in, in certain special technology, actually sent three or four railway cars named on his personality. They arrived at San Georgen. Yeah? So this is maybe only one of the indicators, of, of many other indicators, that give clear evidence that St. Georgen was a very special place at the end of the war, maybe at minimum to collect technologies from all over the Reich to a central place. And maybe this is also what, made, what makes St. Georgen again important along with Hans Kammler yeah, as a collecting point. Yeah, as a collecting point. And it is also interesting when you follow the last route of Hans Kammler. He came from the Alps from Strobel, from the Ebensee area, and it was the liberation. The Americans came in here on May 5th. Yeah? And Hans Kammler definitely was in the area, crossed the Danube, here in the area, not far from here, on May 4th. 
one day before the Americans actually came here. So, and it is a big question of history, yeah? whether the first handshake of Hans Kammler and the Americans took place on May 4th or May 5th in this area. But it is clear that it must be, must have been in this area. Yeah? And, uh, yeah, it's not by chance, I think, yeah, no. that it was May 4th, he crossed at Enst, the river, yeah, to the Mauthausen Gusen St. Jürgen complex, yeah, and then he disappeared, yeah. yeah. And what we also know from research from, from German television and so on, that there exist some documents that clearly say that Kammler did not leave this planet on May 9th in Prague. Yeah? So, and it would be interesting what, what had happened between May 4th, May 5th and May 9th or the actual end of Hans Kammler. Yeah? But it is very, very likely that uh, it is this vicinity uh, in which Hans Kammler uh, came into, yes, got a new life, got a new life, met the Americans, yeah? and he didn't met the, uh, meet the Americans here as a simple general, yeah? he could say, come with me, let take a look underground, look to my tunnels, they are full, yeah? with all Oh yeah, it was a supermarket of high technology, N nothing other. Yeah, but he couldn't because even the Americans said the American colonels uh, were not even allowed to look. Yes, this is what we also have learned from liberators we had contact with in the last two decades. When we asked them, yeah, tell us about Bergkristall, what do you know? They said, no, we can't tell you anything because we also we have, have officers of the U.S. Army, yeah, and 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 we're. Uh, successful in in the war, in in winning the war against the Nazis, the uh, U.S. technical intelligence officers did let them go in. So they were heavily guarded, yeah, and only uh, a selection of of special agents was allowed to get in and to see what was done. Uh, and. Yes, we think that a lot of documents, photographs, maybe movies must exist in the United States uh, from the specialists that were the first to investigate this huge underground industries here at Gusen and St. Georgen. But only a few of these photographs today are available. Yeah, maybe they are lost or hidden. Maybe it will take the next 200 years. They operated in Bergkristall, uh, bomb proof. Uh, a huge electrically heated installation where uh, the salt was melted at around 400 degrees Celsius and this was used, high technology, to soften the aluminum, uh, aluminum alloys yeah? because this was highly alloyed aluminum, hard like steel and, 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 and tensile like steel and in order to shape it, at first you had to cook it yeah? And this special cooking process was also done here, and we know that in all of Nazi Germany only a handful of such salt passes existed. So if you if one of these salt passes would have been bombed out, all, all the German jet plane production would have been stalled immediately with only knocking out one of these, these salt passes. Because without them you couldn't uh, shape the aluminum needed, the high tensile aluminum for high-speed flying aircraft. Yeah? And, and, and this, two of these installations were at Gusen. One at Bergkristall bomb proof and the first one uh, at Gusen already from 19, late 1943 above ground for the original uh, Messerschmitt production, for the wing and fuselage production. So we had maybe 40% yeah, of the strategic reserves of the German uh, aircraft production backbone was here in this area. And it, it seemed like unimaginable. Yeah. And it seemed like it was a surprise to the Americans that it was here. 
I don't know whether the Americans knew, because as I know, the Americans, they had no knowledge of the highly alloyed aluminum. Not only knowing the chemical structure of, of, of the metal is, is not sufficient, you also need to know how it is processed, yeah. how to handle it. Yeah? And this was the know-how. You could find at Bergkristall. Or, for example, another special process hidden here clandestine was also the huge hydraulic presses, because they belonged also to the cooking procedure. Yeah? And as we have learned from US reports, the Americans were astonished, went into this top secret German plant and seeing that the enemy was producing the jet planes with Cincinnati hydraulic presses from America. Yeah? But you know, American hydraulic presses were very precious in Nazi Germany in this strategic war. Yeah? So such things yeah, were <laughs> installed underground at the installations like, like Bergkristall St. Georgen. Because if this press would have been bombed out in any conventional production facility, you wouldn't have got any spare parts from, from the Americans, I think, in, in, in the war, in the strategic war. Yeah? So oh, this was were things that were, were hidden there. Yeah? And also a very important process, you, you see what technology means along with aircraft production. Because the Messerschmitt jets, they were like a Volkswagen. Yeah? It was not important for them that it has a good performance in, in air combat and flying faster than a conventional uh, enemy plane. It was also important for the Nazis that uh, the manufacture, manufacturing was optimized with the, a low number of uh, manufacturing hours and the lowest amount of, of material used. Yeah? All was optimized. Yeah? <clears throat> and to optimize the design of these high-speed flying bodies, yeah, they were the first to use welding for, for aircraft structures. Because the ordinary, ordinary construction is riveting. Yeah. Yeah. The welding's and, lighter. And they, they did welding inside these tunnels. Yeah. And tell me now, since you are coming from California, yeah, there was one guy that worked here in Bergkristall, a Jew from Poland. Yeah. And he survived, one, one of the only Jews that survived, yeah? Karl Littner. And he finally started a new life in Los Angeles. Yeah? And this guy was one of the guys that did the weldings of the jet planes here at St. Georgen. You see that we also have a direct connection from this location here at St. Georgen with the beaches of Santa Monica. Who's in charge of Bergkristall? Yeah, the, a very interesting question. I thought so. Uh, as I told you, Bergkristall was a joint venture. Yeah? It was a joint venture between the Luftwaffe, German Air Force, the SS, and Messerschmitt Company. Yeah? These three. Yeah? And uh, actually, Bergkristall, the building, the tunnels, the, 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 the plant, was a property of the SS. Mm -hmm. SS was represented by the offices I've shown you, yeah. Yeah? because they were a branch office of the Wirtschaftsverwaltungshauptamt in Berlin. As you know, in the final phase of the war, Berlin was bombed out. There was no SS central office in Berlin any longer. So it was very important for them, already in 1944, to disperse certain aspects of of their leadership yeah, to different locations. And one of these locations was St. Georgen. So this was not dealing with Gusen, this is not a subcamp of Mauthausen. Yeah. Dealing with Gusen means to be to have a branch of the SS economical main office of Berlin here on site yeah, with the and economical directors. They signed the contracts with Messerschmitt. This was not done in Berlin, this was done in St. Georgen. Yeah. And uh, this explains why these uh, huge underground uh, projects were carried out in this, in this vicinity. Not only because of the slave labor and the geology, but also that the economical directors were here 
on, on site. Yeah? And it was hit on site. Hotel. And uh, as far as I know, there are exist documents because you ask about the properties. Yeah? Actually, uh, the Messerschmitt company only had the benefit of the output. Yeah? So, because they had to, the material as far as I know was supplied by the Luftwaffe. Yeah? And the final fusages, the output, this was, was the gain of, of the Messerschmitt company, but they had to pay to the SS at first six Reichsmarks, was 670 maybe, for each slave. Yeah, in the production, yeah, uh, this reduced their profits, and they also had to pay rent for using that strategic underground uh, plants at, at Gusen. And I told you that this has started the, this business model already in 1943, uh, in a period when there was not really need for underground pump, pump proof space, but the SS on its own started the Kellerbau project and if, if you have the chance to get into Kellerbau you will see that this was an experimental underground plant because they didn't use concrete for example because concrete was a limited construction material this was used at the Atlantic Wall for defensive structures yeah this was in 1943 concrete was not available for the construction of such underground uh, construction uh, plants. So the SS started to do it conventional because they had a lot of granite and a, a lot of slave labor and like big wine cellars they were lined out with granite. Yeah? Like a wine cellar. Yeah? Beautiful handcrafted stones yeah? and, and hundreds of meters. So this is how they started business. Yeah? And only uh, in 1944 and later when the Führer himself uh, saw it was important what they are doing, yeah, they got access to huge amounts of, 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 of concrete, cement. Yeah. And we know it, it that the song concrete came from vicinity near Prague, Praha, Bohemia, mm -hmm. and, and, and train loads, train loads of, of cement were shipped from, from Czechoslovakia uh, into St. Jorgen in order to uh, uh, make these installations and let me tell you I told you that it's also important when dealing with this complex to know how close it was to the hometown of the Führer himself and we also know two times we, by now we have two, two times we know the, the personal intervention of, of the Führer into the projects here yeah? and the first intervention was in spring 1944 when the Luftwaffe uh, tried to uh, uh, roll out the Bergkristall construction project, it was the Führer himself who said stop. He is responsible for the delay. Yeah? Really? For losing the war personally. I also at Bergkristall, we know this. He said no, you, you can't uh, invest it that huge amounts of concrete at St. Georgen. Nobody knows whether these structures would, uh, would be strong enough to withstand uh, light bombs. So he personally ordered that the Reichsabfeldbodenforschung had to do an experimental explosions five kilometers in this direction behind these hills. A special command of concentration camp Gusen had to dig out tunnels to line them out and then special bombs were, were sent into this area near Gusen by the Luftwaffe to check whether the structures withstand uh, heavy, heavy uh, bomb loads. Yeah? And imagine uh, when the, experiment, the experimental detonations were carried out here, five kilometers from here, heavy, heavy uh, bomb loads. Yeah? And imagine uh, when the experiment experimental detonations were carried out here, five kilometers from here, uh, the chief of the Amtbau, of the, of, the con of the construction office in the Reichsministry, Dorsch, he had personally come to witness 
this ex ex experimental detonations here in the vicinity of Kusen and the same evening he had to drive from here to the Ober Salzburg to report to his Führer. And after getting the report from this high-ranking official of Berlin, then the Führer said, okay, now proceed. Huh? Huh? He personally, he personally said, stop, yeah? let's make this experiment the first and then I, I, I'm the Führer, I'm now releasing you the project. Yeah? And there's also a second document we have, also from the Führer. Yeah? It is in February 1945, Bergkristall is already producing and the guys uh, are reporting to the Führer. My Führer, we will win the war, look at St. Georgian, what we have, look at us, we are the SS and so on. We make it for you. Yeah? And imagine uh, this top secret uh, Messerschmitt chat production had a mastermind. This was not Kamler. Yeah? Uh, the German Air Force took a retired Air Force general. It was Rulof Lucht. Yeah? He was an expert and he coordinated the so-called Messerschmitt Fertigungskreise Regensburg and Augsburg. Yeah? All over coordination and he did this management of the dispersal plants and St. Göring was a, a key instruction, a, a key installation in, in, in this network. Yeah? He coordinated this by plane. He flew with the Fisseler Storch and so on. And it is also documented that from time to time Uncle Rulof, they say, this was Uncle Rulof, not General, Flieger Generalstabsingenieur, this was Uncle Rulof. Yeah? He, when he came to St. Jürgen with the Fisela, he, he turned around, then swept the wings, and then they knew at the, at the SS administration at St. Jürgen, oh, Uncle Rulof is coming. And when Uncle Rulof was coming, he came from the Ober Salzberg, yeah? He came to St. Georgen by plane with the personal orders of the Führer. And one of these uh, events was in February 45, and Uncle Rulof had the order of the Führer, freshly <laughs> from the Führer, and said, the Führer wants you at St. Georgen to rock around the clock. The Führer wants 24 hours production, 24 seven, yeah? because the Führer is needing every plane you are producing at St. Georgen. What I wanted to accomplish with this first episode was to give you a clear overview of the situation and some of the stories rumored to have taken place here. And I wanted to show you the remains of the Bergkristall tunnels. Over the next episodes, I will take you through the rest of the test tunnels, the underground of Linz itself. And more importantly, I want to share what was said to have happened here other than what is established in mainstream history. And just as importantly, I want to go over the Mauthausen report and try and decipher their side of the argument. Now the circumstantial argument of nuclear research, that of rockets that was made here, I will say one thing. If only weapons, fighter planes, were produced here as it is claimed in established history, then there is absolutely no reason why the various authorities should not share all the photos from inside the tunnel systems, or allow me to visit some of these throughout the country. Honestly, the majority of these U-sites throughout the Reich were producing known entities of war materials. Nothing there should be secret. However, even when the Mauthausen report then states that mostly ME-262s were produced here, the question screams out at us, what else was there? The tunnels have been cleaned out by the Americans after the war then by the Russians. Then the Russians blew them up and abandoned them for people to loot and grab whatever they wanted for the previous 50 years. And then mostly they were filled up with cement after that. By not releasing photos of these tunnels simply spurs on more conspiracies. And why did they put a simple shooting trench under the Denkmal protection instead of simply excavating it to prove their position? 
and the possibilities of tunnels not yet found. It is possible. Just last year, an unknown tunnel system was found in Poland. So certainly not everything has been found that is hiding underground. And just because we're open to simply looking, it takes nothing away from the victims of this Holocaust. In fact, it was the former prisoners themselves who insisted that the Bechestal tunnels were protected. It was the former prisoners themselves who wanted the establishment of the Gusen Memorial after everything else had been destroyed of the place. The prisoners wanted these reminders protected of their wartime lives, so we are working for their legacy by simply trying to obtain a glimpse of their wartime place of labor and toil. Those of you who know me knows that I am not a sentimental person when it comes to historical research. I'm very much pragmatic. I want to know what happened. I want to try to understand why people did what they did and describe that to you so you can decide what your own emotions are. But when I started this project, it was sort of a spin-off of looking at a battle that happened I researched for a book. That led me to Project Reisa, that led me to Jonas Tal, and that led me here to Gusen. This was a larger camp than Mauthausen, and almost none of you know of it. The laborers here did various things, and one of them was they dug enormous tunnel systems for the SS Bergkristall you've heard of, and there's another one you haven't heard of, and then there's the other thing. We're still trying to find out what the other thing is. I have a pretty good idea. Now, I understand out of military necessity why you keep secrets. I understand classifications. However, this is 80 years ago. And people died here. They didn't die here at the crematorium. This is where the bodies were incinerated. This is where their final physical form disappeared. And when you walk and look at the walls and you look at the faces of the people who died working in this camp, it's hard to not make it a little bit more personal. Because I would like to at least be able to honor their memory by telling you why they died, what they worked on, because this was not just a stone quarry. They were not just breaking stone to build a bigger hike. They were doing something else. None of the people who did any of this, who caused any of these events or humanitarian crimes are still alive. They're not. So we can move past assigning guilt and blame. But when you actively block any attempt to look underground and try to discover what really happened here, a crime was committed here, crime against humanity. That's fairly straightforward. But why? Why did these people work here and die here why were they ready to kill 20,000 prisoners to preserve a secret for the sake of all the thousands of people who died here? To do honor to their memory, it's time to let historians look and let the chips fall where they may. That is my plea to you.